Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar on extreme heat. This is part of the Woods Institute's ongoing Environment and Energy Panel Series on policy-focused briefings that explore the intersection of environment and energy concerns. Before addressing the main topic, I want to start with acknowledging the Indigenous people on whose ancestral land those of us at Stanford are occupying today. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native people. For today's webinar on This Is Not Your Usual Heat Extreme, I'm thrilled to be joined by Noah Diffenbaugh, Lisa Patel, and Paul Schramm. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. The Woods Institute has been for nearly 20 years, Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical, just solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. We're excited to be a founding pillar in the bold new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, officially launched on September 1 last year. Today's session is part of our continuing exploration of climate-related extreme events. After today, the next Woods Institute webinar will be on urban heat islands on October 5th. Please check the Woods website for information on upcoming events related to climate and sustainability. It's hard to know where to start with an intro to this summer's extreme heat. July was the hottest month in the instrumental record by a whopping 0.2 degrees Celsius over the same month in 2019. I saw yesterday that Phoenix is looking forward to a break this week after a summer with 54 days, including 31 consecutive days over 110 degree Fahrenheit. The all China heat record was broken on July 16th in San Bao. In late August, Spain had its fourth serious heat wave of the summer. And we're seeing the impacts of this heat in excess deaths, illnesses, reduced worker productivity, and crop losses. Climate change is definitely playing a role based on the latest results from world weather attribution. Heat waves like we've seen this summer are now expected approximately every 15 years in the southwestern U.S. and every five years in China. But in the absence of climate change, the heat wave in China would be a one in 250 year event, and the heat wave in the US and Northern Mexico would have been virtually impossible. For a perspective on understanding the recent explosion of extreme heat and what we can do about it, I'm excited to be joined by three distinguished experts. Paul Schramm is the climate science team lead with the Climate and Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC in Atlanta. He coordinates the Climate and Health Program Science Activities and Partnerships, and he serves as the co-chair of the Federal Climate Change and Human Health Group. Paul's work at the CDC focuses on the human health effects of climate change, including the impacts of heat waves, extreme weather events, and vector-borne disease. He's an important contributor to the U.S. National Climate Assessments and the recipient of several awards for his work. Lise Patel is a clinical associate professor of pediatrics at Stanford. She's worked extensively in international development and conservation with experience in Egypt, Brazil, and India. Prior to med school, Lisa was a presidential management fellow with the EPA, where she coordinated the U.S. government's efforts on clean air and safe drinking water in South Asia. In her current role, Lisa is a pediatric hospitalist caring for newborns, premature infants, and children requiring hospitalization. Beyond that, she uses her extensive experience working for government community organizations, and nonprofits to advocate for children's health priorities in the U.S. Noah Diffenbaugh is the Kara J. Foundation Professor and Kimmelman Family Senior Fellow in Stanford's Door School of Sustainability. He's also the, the Olivier Nomalini Family University Fellow in Undergraduate Education. Noah studies the climate system, including processes by which climate change impacts agriculture, water resources, and human health, He's a leading expert on climate extremes, especially drought. If you follow climate news, you will certainly have seen Noah quoted or testifying before Congress. 
He has a distinguished record, not only as a scientist, but also as editor-in-chief of two leading climate journals. Uh, let me start with NOAA. We've seen this uh, profusion of extreme heat. We know that the fingerprints of climate change are all over it. But is this simply a consequence of a uh, warmer mean leading to more extremes? Or are there other processes that are involved? Um, so I think there are two components to thinking about the um, what appears to be uh, in our in our everyday experience an acceleration of extreme heat. And the first is, uh, you know, going back a couple of decades to the IPCC diagram, the cartoon of a bell curve with a shift in the mean and how that simple shift in the mean affects the area under the curve of, you know, what used to be the old extreme. Um, and the really simple statistics of that, of the shift in the mean, as, as, as your question indicated, uh, the simple statistics of that is that we should get an acceleration of extreme heat. We should get a, a, um, an exponential increase just because of the shape of a of a bell curve of a normal distribution. There's a lot of research about the subtlety of, of that in terms of what the shape of the distribution is in different parts of the world. But first order, uh, you know, the 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 world uh, has warmed uh, you know, well more than a degree Celsius now. The areas over land, most areas have have warmed even more than that. And you know, first order, we should absolutely be expecting an acceleration of extreme heat just from that shift in the mean. I think the second component, which I'm excited to talk about with, with our other experts today, is that there's been a lot of research in the last decade about how extreme heat impacts people and ecosystems. And the, the, there's a large body of literature that indicates that that response is also nonlinear. So I think what we're experiencing our, in our everyday lives is really the compounding of uh, an acceleration in the frequency of extreme heat that's completely expected with uh, the nonlinear impacts of extreme heat on people and ecosystems. Let me, great, thank you. Let, let me turn next to Paul. When you think about this from the perspective of the CDC, what are you seeing and, and what kind of warnings do people need to have in order to protect themselves as effectively as they can? Well, we, we certainly see that heat waves and extreme heat have extreme public health consequences. So we see that in deaths and we see that as well as in, in rising visits to emergency departments. Uh, we actually just released some updated info on the average number of heat related deaths in the U.S. each year. And the number had gone up from our previous estimate, which was around 700 up to an average of 1,220 over the, the past few years. Um, and that's also an underestimate. You know, that's based on death certificate data, uh, but it's all, heat is not always recognized as an underlying cause. So we know the numbers are actually even higher than that. Um, so we, we see this rising impact of extreme heat on death, on heat-related illness. Um, and we have communication messages to help people prepare for this because it's entirely preventable. Um, so our, our strategy is to help people stay cool, stay hydrated, and stay informed. Um, and we're hoping that by working with health departments and communities around the country, uh, we can build capacity uh, in communities to prepare for and respond to these heat events. Thank you. Lisa, Paul talks about how uh, heat can have many different kinds of consequences for health and how many times when heat plays a role in a, in a mortality event that, it, that it's not obvious that it was heat that did it. Now, help us understand how heat influences human physiology and, and, and why the consequences can play out in, in so many different health outcomes. 
So it's a great question, Chris. And, and I think the way um, I like to explain how our body handles heat is that we essentially have something like a like a sprinkler system. So uh, we sweat and, the, and our sweat is our really our way of cooling our bodies down. Um, when things get too hot, though, what, what happens is things get warmer. We, we need to keep our temperature internally to about 98 degrees. Um, if we start to get hot, either because we're working hard um, or because we're in an externally warm environment, we start sending blood to the periphery, to our skin, to try to cool down um, from that evaporative process. Um, to do that, your heart has to start pumping more and more of that blood out to your skin to cool it down. And that means less blood that's going to places like your liver, to your kidneys, and to your brain. So the first thing that people often describe when they're suffering from some heat illness or heat exhaustion is that they're feeling dizzy. And that's because the blood, enough blood is no longer going to their brain because your body's working so hard to try to cool you down. People can often um, pass out as a result. This is your, your brain's way of trying to lay you flat to get blood pumping to your brain again. Um, if a person does continue suffering from extreme heat that they can't bring their, their body temperatures down, um, your body literally starts melting, right? Like our, our proteins and the cellular membranes that make up our body exist at a certain temperature. So you literally start melting on the inside and it sets off basically a cascade of various internal harms um, that, that can result ultimately in death. In people where it doesn't reach that point, um, a heat exhaustion can also look like kidney damage um, because they're dehydrated. Um, heat exhaustion can result in heart failure, but especially in somebody that has a weaker heart. And then I can talk more as well um, about what I see in the hospital. Um, you know, I, I've cared for infants that have come in severely dehydrated. Um, sometimes they're overbundled and they can't kick off those blankets. They're just babies, so they don't know how to regulate their temperature. Uh, or they're in overheated apartments. Um, I cared for a young teenage couple that lived in an unair conditioned apartment in Oakland where their infant came in severely high dehydrated. Outdoor workers are in that same circumstance. I've cared for a number of teenage outdoor workers who come in with severe kidney damage. They're young, that, that can be reversible in them, but we know that over time that can result in chronic kidney disease down the line. And then the one that also very con much concerns me as a pediatric hospitalist um, I get called to deliveries if there's a concern for the mother or the infant. I worked two um, shifts last year when we had our heat dome event where temperatures topped 116 degrees in Pleasanton, and it was two of the worst shifts I've had, and I've worked through the pandemic. Um, the number of uh, mothers that were coming in um, with, with some problem, whether it was preterm birth, preeclampsia, or some other um, problem with their pregnancy that raised a concern either for the mother's health or the infant's health. And this too is borne out in the literature. Exposure to extreme heat throughout the pregnancy and particularly in the third trimester does increase your risk for adverse birth outcomes. One of the things we're trying to get a feel for in the conversation today is how environmental and human factors interact to control not only human vulnerability, but broader system vulnerability to the to the economy and how that feeds back and forth to the people. Noah, could you say a few things about other things in society you see breaking in extreme events and how those might trace back to consequences for human health? Uh, well, in terms of what we've seen in in the literature in recent years, um, you know, I, you know, we there's been recent work showing that um, you know uh, injuries on the job uh, increase substantially in um, in severe heat, and I think this is um, a one example of a broader recognition that there are many kinds of impacts that. Uh, haven't necessarily been coded as heat related, but when we look back historically empirically, uh, we see that in fact, uh, the risk is is elevated uh, by severe heat. And so, uh, you know, we see it in uh, labor productivity, we see it in uh, agricultural yields, we see it in insured crop losses. Uh, here in the US, we see it in uh, infrastructure vulnerability, uh, energy system. Um, and you know many of these have costs, direct costs associated with them. And they also have uh, indirect costs that um, that amplify through both uh, our you know for for people and, and also for ecosystems. So uh, you know the the list goes on and on, wildfire and um, 
I think that the the main um, message is that we see it when in analyses of bottom up uh, sector by sector or or impact by impact. And we also see it top down when you know, colleagues like Marshall Burke here at Stanford uh, you know, do the analysis for uh, GDP, for example, even for mean temperature, a lot of those, those impacts uh, from extremes are embedded in that analysis, both at the aggregate level for a mean temperature and at the aggregate level for GDP growth. It's so clear that human health depends at its core on things kind of working across the society, the transportation working, the communications working, the um, job market working, and, and when any of those things break, the implications for human health tend to kind of break out. And, and I think we're seeing that in some of the big statistical analyses of, of the effects of heat, which point to much higher inferred death totals than those you talked about, Paul. Do you, do you want to say a few things about how we understand the societal impacts of heat from a medical perspective like the CDC takes, and also from the kind of climate impacts lab perspective where the uh, inferred consequences of heat for excess mortality is much, much higher than the thousand or so people that are identified as having died of heat related causes in the CDC records. Sure. And and I think the, the most difficult part of that is even knowing the stats on how many people are impacted. So we you mentioned that heat can be an, uh, an underlying cause, and we don't always know that. So one way to look at that is to look at excess deaths. So let's say during a normal summer, a community might expect a certain number of deaths. Um, you can look when there's a heat wave and say, okay, how many people died of any cause? Um, and you can see how that increases. And from that, you can see there are places where you might not expect increasing deaths because of a heat wave, but they're there. Um, for example, there's evidence that violence increases during a heat wave. Um, Dr. Patel mentioned uh, maternal mortality, um, childhood development. There, there are these uh, causes that are um, directly related to heat, but are, are not necessarily showing up in the death certificate as heat related. Um, so that's one way that uh, scientists are looking at what the true impact is by looking at these excess deaths. And then you can do the same with hospital visits, emergency department visits, um, looking at how different is it than normal. Um, because a lot of times it, it, it can sh show up as something like uh, an impact to kidneys even, <laughs> you know, there, there's evidence on that. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention is that heat interacts with a number of other uh, stressors that could cause health impacts. So for example, wildfires um, and uh, the compound effects of a wildfire and a heat wave happening at the same time, um, especially with many areas of the country being in drought or having years of extended drought um, that can combine to cause these compound health impacts. So a heat wave doesn't happen in isolation. A heat wave at the same time as a bad air quality day is going to have worse health impacts, and we see that. Another example is after a hurricane. Um, a hurricane can knock power out for a large number of people, and we've seen several instances in recent years after hurricanes where there's a heat wave. Um, and people don't have air conditioning because their power is out. Um, so you have kind of these cascading health impacts um, where the heat wave doesn't just happen in isolation. Um, so that's something we're really um, worried about and trying to prepare for within the sphere of public health is these compound hazards um, and being able to estimate what the health impacts of those are. Yeah, this issue of uh, losing power in, in a heat wave seems like there are whole bunch of pathways by which that can occur, whether it's a, a severe storm prior to the heat wave or wildfire, or there are lots of examples, even where the heat wave itself uh, knocks power plants off, either because the cooling water is too hot or because the wires sag and, and shorts occur. And that, that sort of connects, Lisa, to the point you raised that uh, individuals and communities can differ dramatically in their in their vulnerability as a result of whether or not they have access to air conditioning, whether or not they have access to cooling centers, uh, 
opportunity to be hydrated, whether they have to be working outside. Can, can you speak a little more to the things you see as key factors to think about that can heighten vulnerability? I'd say to add to that list, in addition to access to air conditioning, um, we we understand that there are many places where there's an association between historically redlined areas um, and um, worse urban heat island effect. So this is um, that heat that beats down on cities that have a lot of co concrete or asphalt um, as opposed to trees or greenery. And that concrete or asphalt takes that heat in and, and really holds onto it. And just to give an extreme example in Phoenix, um, there were measurements of 170 to 180 on that pavement. And this, these are temperatures that are practically boiling temperatures. People would fall and, and suffer third degree burns. That's how hot it would get. Um, so there are areas that are that are physically hotter um, because of our historic um, racist um, housing practices or systemic disinvestment from these places. There are homes that don't have access to air conditioning. There's energy insecurity. So I work with a lot of families that are struggling to put food on the table or even have um, a roof over their heads. And sometimes they can't afford to be paying that air conditioning bill or um, to be able to stay cool within their homes. Um, there were also some really um, terrible stories of prisoners in Texas in facilities that were unair conditioned. And so these are places as well where it's a vulnerable population. They rely upon their, the people that are taking care of them to get them access to cooling. And if there's no air conditioning, there's a higher mortality for it. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I appreciate Paul's point. I actually worked in the hospital one night when they cut the power. This is during wildfire season. It was a high wind event. PG&E just cut the power on us at the hospital, and we learned from that event, we were not prepared. Um, we, it was total blackout in the postpartum unit, so mothers that had just given birth were wandering around the dark, and we learned from that event um, what we could expect in the future. And so the other thing that concerns me, hospitals will have some backup power, but a lot of our clinics are not set up to have backup power. And so how do we think about the places that people could go where they might need help or services and make sure that they have things like solar to keep the lights on in the face of these disasters so that we can offer them um, the services or the medical care they need should they get into trouble? No, could you sort of extend this idea of the landscape of vulnerability by helping understand, like in a, uh, a landscape like the Stanford community, for example, what, sort of what's the, the distribution of temperatures look like? How much difference does it be, make to be in the shade? Um, how much do we see temperatures amplified by being between buildings with this sort of uh, solar oven type effect? And how much difference is be outside of the city in an area that's not paved? Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, we, as you're describing, we each have our own, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a personal experience of that, you know, even, you know, on the scale of you know, 20 feet can be quite a bit different. Um, and, you know, the, the studies, um, you know, that we've already heard about, uh, about the historical, um, you know, redlining and other um, land use uh, policies, uh, when researchers go back and map, just start out with, with the landscape of temperature within a city, um, and then map the you know, the, the history of, of redlining on top of that, uh, you know, there are really substantial differences in, in the temperature, not only in the mean, but in particular during hot events. And I think, you know, for all of these, um, for all of these numbers, all of these temperature numbers, you know, the mean is the, the differences are, you know, sound pretty small, you know, we one point two degrees Celsius of global warming so far, you know, some land areas, uh, you know, approaching two degrees C, um, certainly 1.5 uh, in, in a number of regions already. Um, you know, those are pretty small, but when we talk about the local uh, severity of heat, um, you know, those temperatures on the pavement in Phoenix uh, that we heard about, right, then then those are really substantial. So the difference, when you know, in terms of falling down and getting th a third degree burn, look at the hyper local scale, the difference between being under the the shade of a tree and being out in the on the pavement that's been in the sun for, um, 
you know, 10 or 12 uh, hours of heating by the end of the day, uh, that makes for a really uh, extreme difference. So I think, uh, you know, in terms of the questions about what can be done, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, update um, our, our, you know, the way we manage our, our landscape in ways that are, you know, hopefully uh, low cost, low side effect, and ultimately produce uh, the, the often sought after win-win. And, and I do want to turn to what we can do to deal with it. But, but first, I want to ask Noah a follow-up question on um, where we might be headed in extreme heat. And, and all of us have, have read about the uh, potential for reaching especially wet bulb temperatures that are so hot that humans really can't survive for extended periods. And we've thought about the ministry for the future scenario where where a heat wave is so serious that it that it literally kills millions of people and and are, are we looking at a future where that's a, a realistic possibility or is that still uh, pretty far away in terms of the climate changes we've already seen um so i think you know, my perspective on this is not, you know, someone who who is not a public health expert or a medical doctor. Um, you know, I think that the the key question is is uh, you know how rapid are the changes towards those thresholds uh, in in which parts of the world or even within within a given city relative to the capacity to handle those conditions. So I think we know. Uh, that humans are able to survive, uh, you know, really severe heat in parts of the world. Now we also know, as we've heard, that uh, you know severe heat has really, really big health impacts and and other impacts. And uh, you know, I think the the key question um, is that given that we are so very likely to uh, have widespread uh, heat conditions that really are approaching or exceeding those thresholds. Uh, you know what resources are available, both in real time as well as in preparation for not having those conditions uh, cause those you know, those uh, very severe impacts up to and including death. Okay, well let let me turn now to um, a few minutes of conversation about the things that we can be doing to help improve our level of preparation and to protect especially vulnerable people from the effects of extreme heat. And Paul, do you want to start with some comments about what kind of guidance the CDC provides on this topic? Sure. And and I mentioned this once, and if it's one thing that people take from CDC communication on heat, it's stay cool, stay hydrated, stay informed. Um, I'll repeat that over and over. That's what saves lives. Um, the cool part, try to stay in the shade, try to stay in AC, um, stay hydrated. Hydration is, is critical for preventing negative health impacts uh, when you're exposed to extreme heat. And the stay informed part so that you can plan. You know, many people, you already have somewhere where you get your weather forecasts and you'll hear, oh, it's an extreme heat day, whether that's the local news or if you check um, the weather channel on your phone. Um, the, the staying informed part is really important as well. And then acting on that, you know, if it is, you know, it's going to be extremely hot. Well, maybe don't go outside jogging at 3 p.m., but shift and go in the morning instead. You know, there's little actions like that you can take. Um, to prevent these health outcomes. The other thing is to look out after people you know might be at higher risk. So for example, if you have elderly neighbors, um, you know, children are particularly at risk. We see that in the data. Be very careful about, you know, not leaving children in cars, things like that. Um, so that can help to protect you as well as your family and uh, community members. Um, so again, that's stay cool, stay hydrated, stay informed. Um, so that's at a personal level. Um, at a broader community level, uh, CDC has a lot of guidance documents for health departments, for city planners and their partners around, for example, how to develop a heat action plan and what the different components of that are. Um, when 
how to set thresholds so you know when to trigger different parts of that plan, um, how to do a communication campaign, social media messaging that you can use around uh, heat waves. Um, we have guidance on cooling centers and how those work and aspects that they should have to make them more uh, effective. Um, so we kind of go at it in two ways with that stay cool, stay hydrated, stay informed message uh, for an individual level, but then also re realizing that um, at a broader community level, there have to be actions as well as well. And all of everything that I've mentioned, all of the resources we have are on our webpage, cdc.gov slash climate and health. Um, you can also just search CDC heat and you'll come up with all kinds of great resources. Uh, the social media things I mentioned, there's videos, there's hot weather tips. Uh, we even have activity books for children on extreme events. Um, it's a dog named Wrigley. He's weather ready Wrigley. Uh, and we have one specifically for heat events um, so that children can learn about it as well. Perfect. And thank you so much for those extra resources. Uh, Lisa, you already pointed out that um, people who who um, are too young or too old to make good decisions um, really suffer especially and and also that cognitive function kind of uh, decreases in in heat events and in 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 that context what are some of the things people can do to uh, as Paul says watch out for folks who are having uh, who who can't make decisions for themselves all the time, but also how how do we avoid uh, the bad judgment that comes from from not appreciating that each of us is is susceptible to to heat impacts. You know, I think it needs to start. Um, I, first of all, I, I just want to applaud all the work that the CDC is doing on a string budget. <laughs> and so I would say we need what the CDC does and we need so much more of it, um, but they're very limited by the amount of funding that we put towards this cause in terms of human health. There's a new Office of Climate Change um, and, and Health Equity and the Health and Human Services that unfortunately has been turned into a piece of political football um, because people are needlessly politicizing climate change and health. And so I would say where we need to start, we need a lot more. The CDC's resources are great, um, but they need a lot more reach and they need a lot more resources to be able to accomplish on the mission of what they're trying to do. Um, and we just we needed a lot more opportunity to educate. And so um, my big job right now is I'm actually the executive director for the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, which brings together 50 medical societies understanding that climate change is a profound threat um, to human health and to equity. And what we're trying to do to this point, um, how how do you raise awareness? How how does how do people know to protect an infant or that an elderly could be more vulnerable? Well, one of the key places we think it starts is in the doctor's office, um, in your community. In, in the communication that you're getting from your provider, we think that it's essential that um, doctors, nurses, um, people in clinic facing encounters start communicating with their patients and with their communities on what the health risks are and who is particularly vulnerable. Now that work happens in the clinic and it also happens in conjunction with public health as well to really wait, raise that awareness on what we need, we do need to do to keep people safe. Thanks. Um, I would, I'd like to turn to questions from the audience in just a few minutes. And so let me put up a, another request to enter your questions in the Q&A box. We will get to as many of those as we can. Uh, let me close out this section of the conversation, Noah, with a question about the compound disasters we might expect to see in the future. And, and you and Lisa and Paul have all pointed to the importance of uh, heat impacts in the context of a power failure or exposure to wildfire smoke. Are, are there other kinds of compound events that we ought to be alert to for the future and that we, we may not have seen as much already as we're going to see? I think the short answer is yes. Um, and that we're, we're already seeing them emerge. Um, I kind of with with my answer to the first question about you know with the just the shift in the mean and the bell curve I think you know the the first order effect is really that you know because severe heat is increasing so sharply that the odds that it coincides with some other event randomly are going way up and that's for an event uh you know successive events in an individual location as well as uh, uh, 
co-occurring events in in space, whether it's within the jurisdiction of you know at the county level or the state level, uh, the federal level, or across the world. Uh, there are lots of really interesting climate dynamics that uh, you know are added on top of that. Um, and certainly there are a number of hypotheses now about uh, you know, the atmospheric circulation, ocean atmosphere coupling, and how uh, you know, changes in the climate system in response to global warming could potentially uh, you know, create these kinds of um, uh, what some people call stalling uh, you know, circulation in the atmosphere, where we end up getting more uh, compound events for reasons beyond just the simple bivariate statistics. Uh, but I think that the the first order effect uh, really is, uh, you know, whether it, whether it's uh, the effect of high temperature on drought conditions, the effect of high temperature on wildfire risk, uh, the effect of, of high temperature on uh, you know, successive um, uh, protracted dry spells that are that are very hot that are then punctuated by extreme wet conditions. I think there's there are really interesting uh, hypotheses about the physical climate dynamics for all of those, but first order, uh, we can be confident that that those kinds of compound events uh, will continue to increase simply because the odds of of extreme heat are going up. Yeah, that's super useful. Thank you. Let me turn now to questions from the audience. And I'm, I want to start with one, I think for Paul, this this is from Bruce Clemens. He, he says, Steve Coonan says mm -hmm. that while warming will increase heat-related deaths, it will result in a much larger decrease in cold weather-related deaths. Is this true? Yeah, so certainly that's something we're looking at, um, at least from the data I've seen. We haven't seen a decrease in cold-related deaths, but we have seen an increase in heat-related deaths. Um, one kind of hypothesis behind this is that there's actually a huge difference in health outcomes if you have a heat wave where, say, it's 97 degrees versus 100 degrees. A few degrees difference, obviously humidity, a lot of other things factoring in there can cause a big difference in the health impacts. Um, we don't see that as much on the cold end. You know, if it's three degrees Fahrenheit outside or six degrees Fahrenheit outside, if you go out and you have a long period of exposure, you're still going to have that health impact. So at least from the data that I've seen from CDC, we don't see a corresponding decrease in cold related deaths. Um, that doesn't mean that that signal won't emerge. Um, it's something that I think we we want to continue to look at um, and and continue to have messaging on that to prevent both deaths and disease from heat-related illness, but also from cold-related exposure. And when I look at where human population is concentrated around the world, there aren't that many people who live in the cold parts of the world, and there are really a lot who live in hot parts of the world. Certainly the exposure can can cause a, a big difference. Um, another thing we we also were looking at is the kind of tangential effects around cold. So for example, it's not just cold exposure that causes health impacts. We have to be looking at ice and storms um, and blizzards. And those are changing in ways that it's not always just a reduction. You know, in some areas, there actually can be an increase in blizzard with climate change just because of where the temperature is falling and different patterns in specific regions. Um, so that can impact things like motor vehicle crashes. So it's, a, it's kind of a very complex uh a complex web, but at least when we're looking at directly heat-related and cold-related deaths, we've we've been seeing that increase in heat-related deaths, even with the way that communities are more prepared now than they ever have been. Um, and then we're not seeing the corresponded uh, decrease in cold-related deaths. Great. Yeah, I think Noah might have had something to add as well. Well, yeah, I think the the I, I'm a. Uh... I'm a big advocate for um, you know, being fair and balanced in in uh, all of our quantification, and I, I want to be open minded about there being benefits of climate change. That being said, I think another element uh, to add on this question is that 
uh, you know, we have mechanisms that are quite effective for um, heating and cooling where they exist. And one big difference between decreasing cold events, the extent that that will happen, and increasing heat events is that heat events are increasing, again, very sharply in areas where the most direct, most effective mechanism for protecting one's individual self, air conditioning, doesn't exist. So there's a, from a, you know, in terms of when the events are happening, uh, there's a, you know, potential really big net impact from heat, uh, unless we find a way to catch up on, on uh, cooling, as well as other, as well as the other community and, and public health mechanisms that have been mentioned. Lisa, from a clinician's perspective, is there additional insight you can provide on this question of negative consequence of heat versus negative consequences of cold? No, I, I think both um, Paul and Noah made great points, really. It's about adaptation and where we're seeing these extreme events play out. Um, and, you know, one of the um, one of the things that really concerns me in terms of adaptation, if you look at places like California and what our air conditioning coverage is, you know, something like 60 to 70 percent coverage of air conditioning compared to places that are more traditionally adapted. So places in the south, for example. And so that that's the question is that whether do you have access to that adaptive capacity to handle these these temperature fluctuations? And then what type of temperature temperature fluctuations are you seeing more of? We're seeing more extreme heat um, in areas that don't have access to the air conditioning to stay cool. And and one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that many adaptation strategies are, are effective in a multi-hazard context. So, uh, you know, a cooling center can also be a warming center. And a lot of the issues that we have with extreme vulnerabilities to heat have to do with the unhoused population or the, or the people who are in substandard housing and, and the kinds of interventions we're talking about for protecting those folks from heat will also provide protection from cold. Um, one uh, Another question for, for Lisa comes from Lucy Mize. She says, can you please discuss the impact of heat on mental health as you discussed about maternal health? Sure. Um, so there, the, and the data here is tough, right? There's so many, um, there are so many factors that go into, um, tipping people particularly into mental health crisis, but there are some interesting studies to show, uh, there was a study that came out looking at, um, domestic violence in India that found that, um, as temperatures climb, there are actually more incidences of domestic violence, um, that, that occurred during periods of extreme heat. We know in terms of, or the studies are, are demonstrating a possible link between um, worsening heat waves and more higher suicidality, particularly in people in the adolescent age groups. Um, there seems to be a strong correlation there. Now, if we think about personally, what happens to us on a hot day, we get very hot, we get very agitated. Um, and it's, it's not very surprising that it results in these, ty these types of emotions of possible anger or aggressiveness when we see periods of extreme heat. I don't know if anything you'd want to add. No, I think the only thing I would add is is we also see that again with this idea of compound uh, impacts. So when there's heat and drought kind of interrelated, um, there's emerging evidence on the mental health impacts of that, especially um, for agricultural workers and the the loss of livelihood that can result from heat and drought happening at the same time, and then the mental health impacts that that can have. Um, really, anything that causes a, a a loss of livelihood is going to have an impact on mental health. Um, so we see that uh, that signal pretty clearly. And I also am concerned in a country where we have more guns than people um, in periods of extreme heat and um, people with greater aggression and anxiety, what, what that means. Um, I mean, we know that um, at easy access to guns, especially in, in situations like this, can be really dangerous. Yeah, and another aspect of that is also, um, especially among the younger generation, the health impacts uh, of the climate crisis in general, the, these, the mental health impacts. So the, there's more evidence around that as well on just um, kind of a sense of dread <laughs> that's emerging in the younger generation when they see these heat waves, when they see climate change um, and how um, they expect their life to be um, in the coming decades. Um, so that alone causes a mental health impact, let alone the exposure to heat itself.
really complicating the situation. Let, let me um, let me turn to Noel with a question on on the metrics we use. This is from uh, Mike McCracken, someone who, has, as you know, has worked on climate change for, for decades, and and he's concerned that we're expressing the seriousness of the problem incorrectly. Is is the uh, question is the decadal average of the global average of the daily average metric seems like a very poor metric for indicating the seriousness of climate change, especially given that two thirds of the o- earth is ocean. Why is there not greater mention um, and discussion of other metrics that better show meaningful impacts on humans and the environment? And and he goes on from there. But but I think that that sets the stage. Are, are, we, are we describing the problem right in order to let people make good decisions about action? Um, well, I'm, I, I'm, am, uh, in complete agreement, uh, that we, we as a, as a scientific community, a research community, um, you know, should be investing even more in focusing our analyses of the physical climate system on the phenomena that the the attributes the characteristics processes that really impact people and ecosystems and i think um you know mike both you and chris uh know know a lot better than i do about why it is that uh you know the focus on the golden mean temperature um has been so durable over time Uh, i think you know, there as a climate scientist, there are some physical reasons that we we do want to know what the global mean temperature is. Um, something I've been uh, working on this summer is, uh, you know, what is the relationship between the annual global temperature anomaly and the pervasiveness of severe heat globally? If we do end up getting uh, a year that's 1.5 C above the pre-industrial, uh, perhaps during this El Nino. Um, perhaps soon after, what's the extent of severe heat that that we can expect from that? So I think, uh, you know, thanks to the leadership in particular, I will say, uh, of of Chris uh, through uh, IPCC Working Group 2, I think we've, we've, we've seen a lot of advancement, starting with the SREX, uh, the special report on extremes that, that Chris co-led back in, you know, published in 2012, and then through the Chris's leadership of the AR5, we, we actually did see much more integration of the physical climate metrics and uh, impacts uh, vulnerability and adaptation. So I, I think we're in a better place than we were uh, a decade ago, and there's still uh, a lot of room for improvement. Thank you for saying that, Noah. There, there is really a lot of room for improvements. And uh, and and I wonder if if um, everybody, but, but especially Paul, might want to speak to a question from uh, Badria Diab, can you please share an example of programs you work on with communities to build their capacities so they're more prepared for extreme heat events? Sure. So I'll start with saying CDC doesn't have specific funding on heat, uh, but we do have a small amount of funding on climate change. So much of our work in this area happens um, under that bucket. Uh, So we do have what we call the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative, as well as the Climate Ready Tribes and Territories Initiative. And um, through these initiatives, we provide funding and technical assistance, mostly to health departments, but uh, a few other jurisdictions as well, um, to prepare for and respond to the health impacts of climate change. So we don't require these jurisdictions to work on heat but all of them do um, because through the framework that we provide them with, they use their local data to look at what's uh, their biggest climate hazard. And many of them have identified heat as as one of their top three climate hazards. So they're all working on this. Um, So just an example of what uh, one of them has done, uh, we fund the San Francisco Department of Health um, and they were able to look at a block by block level on the impacts of heat. Um, So they actually went out and they saw what does the urban environment look like on a block by block level? Um, How, what are the uh, demographics at a neighborhood level? And then to overlay those things, I believe they use 21 different indicators. So 
uh, everything from tree canopy to amount of concrete coverage to um, the age, average age of the population in the neighborhood. And they were able to develop a, a metric citywide for which areas are likely at the highest risk of Im health impacts from extreme heat. Um, and then they use that to decide where to put cooling centers, uh, where to focus their communication efforts. Um, so that that's one example of, of how one of our grant recipients has uh, used highly localized data uh, to help community prepare for heat. Um, one other example from a policy level is we have funded a number of states in the Northeast um, and Rhode Island, as well as a few others, got together and created a Northeast Regional Heat Collaborative. And what they did is they worked with their local National Weather Service. Um, so when you see an extreme heat alert for your area, that's coming from your local weather forecasting office, which is part of the National Weather Service. They're all over the country. Their local weather forecasting office was not using any health data to decide when to trigger a heat alert. So when you see an extreme heat warning, uh, you know, it was based on some metric like three days above 90 degrees or something like that. Um, the health department said, hey, wait a minute, we have health data that we can show you on which days are people actually going to the hospital. So this Northeast Regional Health Collaborative, several state health departments worked with the weather uh, National Weather Service and actually changed the thresholds at which heat alerts are issued in the Northeast based on health data. They said, you need to make this lower because we're seeing these health impacts at a lower temperature. Um, so that's something we've seen as well that, that can be done. And that's a real policy impact because then that part of stay cool, stay hydrated, stay, stay informed, it increases the stay informed part because people are knowing, oh man, it's only 87 degrees, I'm, I'm fine, right? Well, no, the data shows you could go to the hospital even at that temperature. Um, so those are kind of two different examples. One, a very local, data heavy example and one that is using regional health data to help change policy. Perfect. Thanks. And and Lisa, I know you've been a strong advocate for heat related programs in California. Do you want to speak to some of the things that you think are most promising or have been most successful? Sure. Yeah. Um, I um, got to work with the Center for Innovation and Global Health um, through their um, alpha program on coming up with a report on how we build climate resilient schools. That report actually resulted in this very large coalition, a piece of legislation that's been introduced to ask the state to create a master plan for how schools can achieve our K, TK through 12 public education system in California can achieve climate resilience. So this thinks about not just one of these threats, but really taking it all together, because as we've talked about here, climate change is a compounded threat. Um, and we have enormous opportunity to protect children's health and learning and turn our schools into places of climate resilience by accessing things like the dollars through the Inflation Reduction Act to um, install solar, for example, to get fossil gas out of our buildings, for example. Um, so that's been wonderful to be a part of because what, what I've learned from that is how many people, um, not just in the health world, but educators, sustainability experts, parents, students, um, are very, very deeply invested and interested in this issue. Another place so that we're working on through the Medical Society Consortium in collaboration with the National Association of Community Health Clinics is again, how do we, the Inflation Reduction Act um, is the largest investment that has been made in climate change by Congress ever. And so how can community clinics that serve um, an underserved population be able to keep the lights on by installing solar um, in their clinics to ensure that they can uh, offer continued care? But the biggest piece, and we haven't talked about this, right? We as physicians, clinicians, prevention um, is, is uh, what is it? The an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We have not talked about the role of fossil fuel in causing all of this. And so there's this actually this advertising campaign right now to name heat waves after the various oil companies like the Chevron heat wave or the Shell heat wave. I think we need a lot more awareness that there is a point at which we cannot adapt. There are places of this earth that will no longer be inhabitable. And so we can do our all to prepare people, but the primary problem here is the burning of fossil fuel. And that's where the consortium spends a lot of its time and energy on that policy piece how do we transition off fossil fuels? How do we remove the social license of fossil fuel companies to pollute and move us towards a renewable future? Terrific, thank you. Let me ask one final question and then I'll come back to each of um, you on the panel for a, for a closing thought. This, the final question is for Noah from uh, Mary DeBoer. Uh, 
and it it concerns adaptation potential. It says there's a lot of interesting low cost adaptive tech coming out of low and middle income countries, like the super white paint being trialed in in Gujarat, India. Um, what do you think about these kinds of adaptive solutions, and and how much should we think about uh, tech opportunities for addressing the combined problem of of vulnerability and exposure? Um, as someone with with no uh, expertise in technology or any other solution, I'm a real optimist. Um, actually, I, this this relates to your question earlier, Chris, about you know kind of the just the you know what are what's the spatial heterogeneity of temperature here on campus or any other local place um and that I, i've been thinking that back when i was doing my dissertation i worked on land surface atmosphere interactions and you know these kind of questions at, at a larger scale and i remember early in my phd i, I explained to my mother-in-law what i was working on and and uh she said well, that's pretty obvious. Like everybody know, knows it's cooler under a tree than out on the pavement. And she was really right. My mother-in-law was really right. And I think, um, you know, if, if we look at, at um, you know, all the different ways that there are to calculate the, the surface energy balance, whether it's, you know, really local scale or in a global climate model, um, you know, the, the, the biggest influence on, on the surface temperature in any location is is the land surface and so uh and we, and we see that through you know in, in observations and you know both in, in situ and satellites and so i think that the bottom line is that for the local conditions uh you know these white paint absolutely planting trees absolutely um and and i think really you know this comes down to to equity and justice, and right, we we have as we as we've already discussed a you know really long history of inequality uh, in, in many ways here in the U.S. and and and, in, and including in inequality in in climate adaptation. And I, I think that that for the local conditions, there are there's just a huge suite of potential low cost win win co benefit actions that can be taken and uh that that includes technologies that are being invented now and includes a lot of 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 uh technologies and actions that have been known for a long time and i think that you know the real challenge is how do we make sure that we accelerate our our efforts in deploying those yeah that's a wonderful closing thought is there anything more you'd want to add noah now, it's been a great discussion. I've, I've, I've learned a lot. So thanks for- Lisa, me. a quick closing thought. Um, no, I'm, I'm very hopeful for the future. I think our problems are big, but so are the opportunities, I think, to, to create a better and healthier world. Paul. Um, I would just point out one more resource, heat.gov, um, CDC's co-chair of the group of federal agencies that put that together, kind of a one-stop shop for heat resources. Um, and then you can probably guess my my closing thought, stay cool, stay hydrated, and stay informed. Nothing much I can add to, uh, to that. Thank you so much, Paul, Lisa, Noah. Fabulous discussion. Thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. If we didn't get to your question, we'll post an answer online. And thank you to the superb Woods Institute staff, especially Lee Rosenbaum, Kamaya Daniels, Molly Field, Roberta Tugenreich, Celia Daniels, and Christine Black. And thanks to Evan Black for help with the audio and video. So long, everyone. <laughs>